I'll give you the short version first. Goblet of Fire is far and away the worst Harry Potter movie, a glaring outlier in an otherwise solid film series. It relies on cheap drama and unfunny jokes to tell its story, offers little of substance compared to other films in the series, and is downright painful to watch if you were a fan of the book, which it puts a laughable effort into trying to emulate. Still want to watch this video? Okay then, let's get to work! Awesome, Zuck. I can remember where I was when I saw each of the Harry Potter films and the impression they left. Some of them were simply an enjoyable afternoon at the theater, others made my head spin from how fast-paced they were in comparison to their novel counterpart, and a few were what I would consider top-tier cinematic entertainment. And then there was Goblet of Fire. Oh my god! I've killed Harry Potter! I saw Goblet of Fire on Thanksgiving in 2005. At this point, Goblet of Fire held a coveted spot as one of my favorite Harry Potter books. I loved its complex mystery plot and the new characters it introduced, as well as story pieces such as the Quidditch World Cup, the Triwizard Tournament, and Harry's duel with Voldemort. I was excited for the movie adaptation, knowing all of these things should translate incredibly well to film. There was no way the movie version was going to be anything less than amazing. So of course, 15 minutes in, they decide not to show the World Cup. Let's backtrack a bit. After the critical and commercial success of Prisoner of Azkaban, Warner Brothers offered Alfonso Cuaron the chance to direct Goblet of Fire as well. But due to the time demands and the fact that he would be wrapping up post-production on Prisoner of Azkaban as production began on Goblet of Fire, Cuaron had to decline. Warner Brothers would have to find a new director. Their pick? English director Mike Newell, whose work included For Weddings and a Funeral and Donnie Brasco, and whose career highlight since Goblet of Fire has been the beloved romp of summer 2010, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. To prepare for Harry Potter, Newell went the extra mile and committed himself to reading the book his film would be based on. Oh wait, no he didn't. Newell never read the book version of Goblet of Fire, or even the other books in the Harry Potter series, to get a better understanding of the characters, tone, and world he had been entrusted with. And boy howdy does that cluelessness shine through in the final product. Piss off. I'll break it down. The film opens, as did the book, at the Riddle House. Frank Bryce, the groundskeeper, notices a disturbance coming from inside the house and goes to investigate. He sees Wormtail talking to Voldemort, along with David Tennant? Okay then. Don't remember him in the book. Voldemort asks Wormtail to turn his chair around, and Frank promptly finds himself a Vada Kedavra. This causes a tea kettle to go off. Meanwhile, Harry's scar is hurting him, and he wakes up in the Weasley's house next to Hermione. Wait, what? When did Harry leave the Dursleys? It's an unusual transition, but the Dursleys aren't important to the plot of this film, so we can skip them and not lose too much. Still, I always enjoyed watching their shenanigans. Harry, Hermione, and the Weasleys all leave for the Quidditch World Cup. On their way, they meet Cedric Diggory and his father. They grab the port key and arrive at the World Cup. Mr. Diggory and Mr. Weasley appear to be riding invisible unicycles as they land, Whatever. What follows is the worst line in the series. The Weasleys lead Harry into their tent, but this is no ordinary tent. It's quite cozy, yet roomy inside, and looks deceiving from the exterior shot. How does Harry respond to this? I love magic. Maybe the twist of this film is that Harry is being impersonated by Ralph Wiggum. Yeah, that's it. He must have entered a wormhole into the Harry Potter universe and drank some Polyjuice Potion, because that's the only scenario in which I love magic makes sense as something Harry would actually say. We next find our heroes at the Quidditch World Cup. They run into the evil Malfoys, but who cares? This is the Quidditch World Cup, one of the biggest events in the wizarding world. The game is just about to begin, Ireland versus Bulgaria. 
The crowds are cheering. Cornelius Fudge announces the start of the game and it cuts to inside the Weasley tent. When I first saw the movie, I was confused at this part. I thought maybe the game was going to be longer in the film version and they were taking a short break in the tent but would go back to their seat soon. But then the Dark Mark scene began and all I could think was, wait, what just happened? Why did the World Cup stop? More importantly, we never find out who won. There was literally no reason to show the entire scene up to that point. It introduced Crumb, but you never see him catch the snitch or do anything interesting, which is pretty much his character arc through most of this film anyway. Why show the lead-up to the Quidditch World Cup without the payoff? The Dark Mark scene follows, but without the same sense of menace and chaos it had in the book, where it showed the Death Eaters torturing muggles. This sent a frightening message to the complacent wizarding world that it still wasn't safe, even years after Voldemort's downfall. The version in the film is essentially what you'd see after an Eagles Super Bowl win. <laughs> and then it's off to Hogwarts. The opening feast is where this film really starts to pile on the comedic overload. First, we see Argus Filch. Given how likable most of the characters in this film are, I wish Filch would shut the doors of the Great Hall and turn the start of school feast into a Red Wedding-esque bloodbath. But we won't be so lucky here. Next, we meet Mad-Eye Moody, who is also a walking punchline. I think this is on purpose since, spoiler alert, he's being impersonated by Barty Crouch Jr. I like Brendan Gleeson's performance, but the character isn't given a whole lot to do other than occasionally help Harry and generally act like a loon. You don't really get a sense of his history or what it means to be an Auror outside of exposition that's very awkwardly delivered. The scene concludes with the introductions of Bow Battens and Durmstrang, which for no discernible reason are portrayed as an all-girls and an all-boys school, respectively. The Bow Battens girls sigh and let out paper cranes, while Newell gives us close-ups of their underage asses. Why? The Durmstrang boys do twirls and flips, and violently bang their staffs against the floor. Again, why? Phallic symbol, phallic symbol. There is a deleted scene that turns this into a comedic beat with the Hogwarts students singing their school song, but seeing as this movie is bubbling over with gags already, I understand why it was cut, as virtually every scene and character in this film is cartoonishly over the top. There's a pretty clear difference between a given actor or actress's performance in this film and any of the other films their character appears in. It's almost as if Mike Newell wanted this to be a parody of Harry Potter. For example, at the scene where Harry's name comes out of the Goblet of Fire, Dumbledore is displeased. That is to say, Dumbledore goes apeshit and nearly rips Harry's arms out of their sockets. I thought I was watching Christian Bale's Batman. Where's the trigger? Where is it? Where is it? In the novel, Dumbledore was clearly concerned but he would never manhandle Harry like that, and is generally in control of even the toughest situations. His actions here are completely out of character, and while Michael Gambon's performance across the series was a mixed bag, it's particularly bad here. So Harry is thrust into a situation he dreads, and he and Ron bicker about him getting all the attention. There's a long-winded scene where Hermione delivers a message. Ronald would like me to tell you that Seamus told him that Dean was told by Pavati that Hagrid's looking for you. Is that right? Well, what? For God's sake, people, we have a 734-page book to adapt here. Why are we wasting a minute on a joke that makes Family Guy look quick and sharp in comparison? Ah! Ah! The first task is decent. I understand that they need to liven things up for the big screen by having the dragon break loose and chase Harry on top of Hogwarts, 
but there are other chances for quality action scenes later in the movie that the filmmakers don't take. But we'll get to that soon enough. So Harry, dragon's egg in hand, celebrates with his friends in the Gryffindor common room. He is clearly enjoying his success. Not just enjoying it though, Harry is relishing his victory, like he's about to do a keg stand. Who wants me to open it? Yeah! Do you want me to open it? Yeah! This is where the character of Harry Potter becomes unrecognizable, and it only gets worse. In the book, Harry never really celebrates his wins. These are horrifying situations he finds himself in, and he's happy enough just to get away with his life. Any celebration occurs around him, with characters like Fred and George making light of it. The film does a horrendous job of showing that Harry is in danger. In fact, it devotes the next 20 minutes to the Yule Ball. I didn't check exactly how much time was spent on it. All I know is that a couple chapters of the book take up what feels like a quarter of the film. A huge stretch of time in which nothing necessary to the plot happens. We are no closer to knowing who put Harry's name in the goblet, which is the central mystery of this story. This whole section is nothing more than an excuse for the filmmakers to show off their quote-unquote sexy teen stars. We also get a wizard mosh pit scene. Of all the things in this film, I wish I could unsee. It's also an excuse to get some more juicy teenage drama in there since I guess Ron telling Harry to piss off earlier just didn't cut it. Ron is complaining about Hermione going to the Yule Ball with Crumb, and Hermione, in tears, declares her displeasure. Older. Ron, you spoiled everything! This line is more of the ham-fisted angst typical of this film, but there was something about the situation and delivery that makes it stand out. Maybe the melodrama is so thick here that this is the straw that breaks the hippogriff's back. All I know is that this particular line confirmed that Ron can indeed be held responsible for all the world's tragedies. The first in the flesh, get this started, get this started. It's fighting, and it's fighting, it's fighting terrible. Oh my, get out of the way, please. There's kind of a lull in the film between the Yule Ball and the second task. There's nothing too exciting, but nothing too offensive either. Oh, who am I kidding? Of course there is. This is Goblet of Fire, after all. Hermione mentions that her relationship with Crumb is more of a physical one. That's gross. Why was that line in the film? Hermione's not shallow like that. She likes Crumb because he's normally shy, but opens up to her when they're studying in the library together. The film reduces that relationship to more of a physical one, for a cheap laugh. Cheap laughs and overwrought drama are this film's bread and butter. And the film continues to awkwardly sexualize its child stars. Harry goes to the prefect's bathroom to decipher the egg's clue and runs into Moaning Myrtle. <laughs> What is it with this film and putting Harry into enclosed spaces with women much older than him? Maybe this was why Mike Newell was never brought back. The second task is okay. There isn't technically anything wrong with it, and it follows the book pretty closely, but the lake is not much fun to look at. I like how the film's color palettes gradually get darker and less vibrant as they progress, but this film took it too far too soon. Everything is gloomy and visually uninteresting. It's the Twilight Princess of Harry Potter movies. Harry is successful in the second task, and Charlie Chaplin cosplayer Barty Crouch Sr. is found dead. Alas, Barty, we hardly knew ya. While visiting Dumbledore's office, Harry falls into the pensieve, probably because the visual effects team hadn't discovered smoke yet, and finds himself in a ministry trial room. Karkaroff, Durmstrang's headmaster, is on trial, and we learn he is a former Death Eater, but this scene is so rushed that any information from it is rendered useless. We learn that Snape used to be a Death Eater, but this is never reacted to by any of the main characters, or mentioned again. Karkaroff accuses Barty Crouch Jr. of being a Death Eater, who just so happens to be in the room. 
Why would you be present at the trial of one of your cohorts if he is there specifically to spill secrets about the Death Eaters? You know what, Barty? You're dumb. You deserve this. Anyway, now it's time for the third task. And if you thought this task would be better than the other two, well, shame on you. The third task is a joke and an insult to anyone who read the books and was expecting anything as exciting as a maze filled with sphinxes, blast-ended scroots, dementors, and other magical creatures. They remembered to have a maze and forgot the rest. The vines move and swallow up the champions, and there is an ominous wind through the bush. This maze brought to you by M. Night Shyamalan. After escaping from emotionless zombie Victor Crumb, which is to say, regular Victor Crumb, except with glowing eyes, Harry and Cedric wrestle with one another, racing to get the cup. In the novel, Harry greatly respects Cedric and wants him to take the cup. Here, he nearly lets Cedric get eaten by the maze. If I had never read any of the books or seen any of the other films, I would hate Harry by this point. He's a jerk. Harry and Cedric both touch the cup. This transports them to the graveyard where Voldemort's rebirth will take place. Wormtail uses Avada Kedavra on Cedric. His lifeless body hits the ground. Do you hear that? That's the sound of legions of Twilight haters cheering. This is the closest thing to watching Edward Cullen die we will ever get. I have to admit that for as little as this film has followed the spirit of the novel, this scene is actually executed pretty well. I would have liked a bit more talk with the Death Eaters, but what's there is good. The duel doesn't disappoint, nor does Ray Fiennes as Voldemort. An explanation of Priori and Cantatum and why it happened would be nice for those who didn't read the book, but that's not this scene's fault. Harry returns with Cedric's body to Hogwarts. Celebration music starts playing, because as far as everyone knows, nothing bad has happened. Then, they see Cedric's body, and the whole mood shifts. It's done surprisingly well. Harry is screaming and crying, and while many people criticize Daniel Radcliffe's acting in this scene, I thought he was convincing, as was Mr. Diggory, who looks legitimately heartbroken and makes this scene uncomfortable to watch, which, unlike the rest of the film, is a compliment in this case. Moody takes Harry back up to Hogwarts and reveals that he put his name in the goblet. Dumbledore, Snape, and McGonagall come to save Harry in the nick of time, and Moody transforms back into Barty Crouch Jr. This seems like a good chance to mention that the Crouch subplot of the novel is completely butchered in the film. I understand that the filmmakers wanted to focus more on Harry for the sake of time, but some extra detail was needed here. It creates a plot hole when you consider that in the previous film, Sirius Black escapes from Azkaban, which is unthinkable and is cause for widespread panic. In this film, we never find out how or why Barty Crouch Jr. escaped from Azkaban, and either nobody noticed or nobody cared that he did. An intricate scheme that merits description, like switching places with his dead mother, was the only possible way he could have gotten out. On top of that, David Tennant is horribly miscast in this role. In fact, Barty Crouch Jr. is the most miscast character in the entire series. In the film, He's portrayed as an over-the-top psychopath, complete with a tongue twitch. While I admit that I found this amusing, it's nothing like the character from the book, and actually makes the situation less frightening. In the book, he is shy and nervous, a schoolboy from a privileged family gone bad. That's why he's so scary. He's the last kind of person you would expect to be a Death Eater, which makes the atrocities he commits all the more terrifying. We also never learn of his fate, the Dementors kiss, so we're left with a character with no background and no resolution. The film sputters to its conclusion. There is no setup of any conflict between Dumbledore and the Ministry of Magic, and the threat posed by Voldemort's return is glossed over. The ending of the book made the three-year wait for Order of the Phoenix agonizing because it ended on such major cliffhangers. The movie fails to do that, and just kind of stumbles to a close, and ignores the ramifications of the story's events. Well, 
I shouldn't say that. There's a decent eulogy for Cedric from Dumbledore, as well as this gem by Miss Granger. Everything's going to change now, isn't it? Yeah, no shit, Hermione. And that's the end. As you can imagine, my expectations for Order of the Phoenix were rock bottom after this. But thankfully, the producers righted the ship, hired a more competent director, and didn't let this abomination define the rest of the series. Still, it remains the only bad installment out of the main Harry Potter films. So you're probably asking yourself, what does this film do right? Well, not much. But to its credit, the things it does do right pay off in future films. I'm mainly talking about the casting, as the new characters are all very well cast. They turn in some of the hammiest, most overblown performances in the film, but the casting itself was spot on. Such additions to the series include Ray Fiennes as Voldemort and Brendan Gleeson as Moody, along with Miranda Richardson as Rita Skeeter. Of the film's many failures, the biggest was its inability to make me care about the protagonists. In all the other films, I cared about Harry and the other characters, and their hardships and triumphs were shared by me as a viewer. I never got that here. These weren't the characters I knew and loved from the books, or even from the other films. Some of the content from the books that would have added depth to the characters was left out of the film. An example is Harry giving Fred and George his prize money. It demonstrates Harry's generosity and selflessness and shows how Harry, Fred, and George are resilient in the face of hardships. It also explains how the twins are able to open a shop by the sixth film. But such a scene wouldn't fit in this version of Goblet of Fire, where character development gets shafted in favor of cringeworthy yags. We have time for Snape physically abusing children, but not time to process the revelation that Snape is a former Death Eater and now a double agent for Dumbledore. The lack of attention to detail in this movie is staggering, even compared to some of the other films. Why would Harry write Sirius Black on an envelope to him when he knows he is being hunted by the Ministry? Goblet of Fire should be where the relationship between Harry and Sirius really develops, and yet Harry only speaks to him once in the entire film, where he's a pile of embers. I hope Gary Oldman was well compensated. The film also suffers from not having John Williams as its composer. His score for Prisoner of Azkaban is nothing short of genius, and I'll always wonder what could have been if his music had underscored iconic scenes in the series, like the duel with Voldemort, Dumbledore's death, the Battle of Hogwarts, etc. Williams would have at least polished this turd of a film. Patrick Doyle does his best with the hand he was dealt, but it seems he received little direction beyond making the accompaniment sound spooky and mysterious. And finally, why is everyone's hair so long? I think Hogwarts needs a barber. Originally, the video was going to wrap up here, but over the years, so many people I've shared my opinions with have said something along the lines of, yeah, Goblet of Fire could have been better, but Half-Blood Prince? That's the bad Harry Potter movie. And I don't agree with that at all. Half-Blood Prince definitely has some flaws. It spends a lot of time focused on Harry, Ron, and Hermione's love lives to a greater extent than even Goblet of Fire did, which I just spent this review complaining about, and it could have delved more into Voldemort's backstory that was shown in the book. And yes, the attack on the burrow comes out of nowhere and is never mentioned again. But so many people fixate on these things while ignoring all the strongest points of Half-Blood Prince. For one, the cinematography is stunning and earned the film a much-deserved Oscar nomination. All of the performances are top-notch, with Tom Felton giving one of the best in the series. Even Michael Gambon's Dumbledore manages to be somewhat charismatic. And some of the changes made for the film actually improve on the book material. One of my favorite scenes is where Harry convinces Slughorn to give him the memory. In the book, 
Harry gets Slughorn drunk and emotionally manipulates him into giving it to him. Harry is conniving rather than honest, and Slughorn probably won't remember any of it in the morning. In the film, on the other hand, Slughorn is completely aware of what Harry is trying to do. Harry's appeal to Slughorn feels more genuine, and when Slughorn agrees to help Harry, it makes both of their characters so much stronger. And for as much as everyone complains about the teenage romance, it is keeping with the spirit of the book, which had more of that than people remember, and which results in some pretty funny scenes. Oh, to be young and to feel love's keen sting. Definitely funnier than any of the ham-fisted attempts at humor in Goblet of Fire. For me, the strong parts of Half-Blood Prince far outweigh the weaker ones, and it doesn't deserve to be labeled the worst Harry Potter film. Fantastic Beasts movies notwithstanding, that title easily goes to Goblet of Fire. Fortunately, there is a place where we on Jorkler's fandom can banish bad content to, somewhere where they will be punished for their crimes, contained so they may never sully cinema with their presence again. I speak, of course, of Dante's Inferno. Twilight Princess is already there, and it looks a bit lonely. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, I banish you deep into Dante's Inferno. May J.K. Rowling have mercy on your soul. Thanks for watching this video. If you love Goblet of Fire, feel free to comment. I genuinely want to know what good people see in this film. Or if there's another Harry Potter film that let you down, tell me about it. And as always, like and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. I have a whole list of video ideas I want to do, so stay tuned for more. See you next time, and don't forget to do the hippogriff. Yeah, yeah, yeah.